Welcome back. Today is Lecture 16, Math 241. Uh, we are in the middle of Chapter 6, Section 5, Applications of Integration. So we are doing work problems. Um, we left off yesterday. Let me read the problem first. We'll get the diagram back up here, and then we'll see where we are on this problem. Uh, a right circular conical tank of altitude 20 feet and radius of base 5 feet has its vertex at ground level and its axis vertical. If the tank is full of water, find the work done in pumping the water over the top of the tank. So we have this for our diagram. Uh, what we do is, and I, I really didn't say much about this yesterday, but you want to take the situation that you're handed diagram it appropriately, but not just diagram it appropriately, but try to develop an axis system such that when you draw this thing, it's going to be easy to figure out what an x value is, and a little bit later in this problem, which we haven't used yet, what a y value is. So we can describe each slice in terms of its radius or thickness or the x value or the y value fairly readily, and sometimes it changes problems drastically based on where you place your axis system. So on this diagram, it was already placed for us, but it's nice and convenient that the y-axis comes right down the center of the cone, and the x-axis is down here at the base or the vertex of the cone. So that's going to make describing or defining this line which serves as the edge of the cone, it's going to make that a little bit easier for us. So when we get to choose where to put the axis system, that becomes a pretty important choice. So what do we have thus far in this problem? We have the diagram so that we can name this line. We have the slices of water, not just to see how much water is in them, but kind of what kind of force it's going to be necessary to move that particular slice of water. So we do have the volume of that slice is pi r squared h. The radius is x. So from the y-axis over to a point on this line. We don't know what that is yet, but we do know it's x. The height or thickness of each slice is delta y, which will become dy in the integrand. So that's how much water there is in there. And if we want to take then the volume times the density to figure out what kind of force is going to be necessary to move it. So we'll take that volume with the values that we decided, the radius is x and the height is delta y or dy, multiply it by the density, which is 62 and a half pounds per cubic foot. So where do we get the cubic feet? Let me redo this because I was, we were kind of in a hurry at the end of class. X is a linear distance measured in feet, so X is in feet, and that's X squared, so that's X squared. I guess technically there's a square feet here also because the unit two feet gets squared, so you have two square feet. DY is also in feet. The thickness, or delta Y increments of Y, are also in feet, so there's our units over here. So there's feet squared times feet, which is feet cubed, which knock out with feet cubed here. So you can kind of keep track of your units, and it should sound like a force, which pounds kind of sounds like a force that's going to be required to move that particular, and that represents any slice of water. So at this point, we have in our integrand pi x squared dy, and we may not like the order that things are in, but this is kind of how we've gathered them thus far. So there's our force. What else do we need in the integrand if we're going to do a work problem? Force and distance. distance. So we have to go back to our figure and see how far each slice of water needs to travel to get to the top of the tank. So we need distance out here. 
Now in some problems, the distance is just going to be little increments of y, or little delta y's, or little delta x's, but in this case, each slice of water has to travel a different distance. This slice of water has to travel this distance to get to the top of the tank, right? Or if you want to think of it as coming over here, this distance, that's the same. This slice of water down here has to travel that distance to get to the top of the tank. So distance is going to be variable, and it's not just going to be some increment of x or increment of y. So this diagram is pretty nice. Now think of the fact that we're going to have to come up with this on our own, but in fact that's probably better at this point for us to come up with this on our own. So we have this axis system that's coming down here. Uh, this point was, the radius was 5 feet, so that's over 5 and what? How tall was the tank? 20 feet? So if we go over 5 units and up 20 units, we're at that point. So we establish coordinates for that. Why? Why would we want coordinates for that point? Where's that going to be helpful? We need the slope of that line. So we've got this point strategically placed down here at 0, 0. So we can find the equation. Uh, I don't know that we came up with that. It was on the diagram, but we haven't really talked about that. So when we're drawing our own diagram, that's why I'm kind of abandoning that um, canned little diagram and us coming up with our own. So here's our slice that we're talking about. We know how much force it's going to be required to move it. We know the radius of that is the x value of that point on the line. We know this distance right here is the y value of that point on the line, but that's not how far we need to move that slice to get it to the top of the tank. We need to move that slice that distance, right, to get it to the top of the tank. So this entire distance is 20. This distance from the point down to the x-axis is y, so this has got to be 20 minus y. Is that all right? So we come up with this stuff on our own. It's not going to be plastered on the figure that's in the book or provided for you on a homework or a test. So we have the volume, the density. So there's the force required to move that slice. How far does that slice have to go? There's how far it has to go. And if you look at any other slice, it will also travel. In other words, if the y value is down here, the y value is smaller because we're not very far above the x-axis. You still describe how far that slice goes by saying it's 20 minus the y value to get to the top of the tank. So there's distance. Uh, now that we're here, well, this tank is full of water. So where do we get our first slice of water in terms of y? Because we're going to integrate with respect to y at 0. So right on the other side of 0 is our first slice of water. We've got to move that too. In fact, that has to move probably the furthest distance, even though there's not much there. And since this is full of water and we're integrating with respect to y, we integrate to what? To 20, right? So we get slices of water from y equals 0 all the way up to the top of the tank, which is y equals 20. So what can stay and what needs to be changed somehow? 20 minus y can stay, right? Why can that stay? because we're integrating with respect to y, x squared's got to go, right? 
but it's got to go in a way that we can describe x in terms of the interrelationship of the x and the y's where? On the side of the cone. Well, the side of the cone, if you look at it two-dimensionally, is just a line. So we need the equation of that line. Now, Nicole already said it was on the other diagram. It was, but when we do a problem, we have to come up with this ourselves. So we have two points on that line, 0, 0, and 5, 20. So the slope is difference of y's over difference of x's, 20 over 5, which is 4. And the line goes through the origin, so it's y equals mx, right? Or if you want to go back to this, if it's not quite so simple as it is in this case, So there's the equation of that line. So what do we need? Y equals 4X. We want to get rid of X. Okay. So we need something that X is equal to on that line. So X is equal to Y divided by 4. So we make that substitution. Now, we're going to move some things, but right now, for x, let's put in y over 4. So the integrand kind of looks messy. Well, let's clean it up. Any questions about the setup, first of all, before we go any further? Is it hot again in here? Do you want, let's try to open the door again, Chandler. See if that'll help. Of course, my hot air isn't helping, is it? Any questions about the setup? Volume, density, so volume times the density tells us the force necessary to move it. This is how far each slice is going. All right, let's clean things up. What can we move and where? Pi can go out front. What else? 62.5 can go out front, and 1 16th, right? Don't we have a 1 16th? Because we've got y over 4 squared, so that division by 4, 4 squared in the denominator. Is that it? All right, so what's left in the integrand? We've got a y squared. and a dy. Is that all right? So things that we can take and farm out to the front, it's to our advantage to do it. I don't think the integration is necessarily the toughest part of the problem. In fact, I think you'd find it to be the easiest part of the problem. So we've got 20y squared minus y cubed. What will our units be on this problem? It's work. What are our units that we're working with in this problem? Foot pounds, right? Feet, because each slice is going to travel so many feet to get to the top of the tank, and then how, what kind of force are we moving it with? So many pounds of force. So when we integrate and evaluate our answer will be in foot pounds. Anybody think that we need to spend our class time integrating and evaluating at this point in time, Jacob? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank, you thank you for clarifying. Okay. <laughs> how, did, how did you find density? Uh, it was the 62.5. Yeah. That was given to us. That's the density of. Water in, in like arm in metric, not metric, but okay. In kind of normal units. <laughs> um, other things that we deal with in a problem, they will tell us what the density is. For example, if we're dealing with some oil in a barrel, would you expect it to be more dense or less dense than water? Mm -hmm. 
What, what happens when you put oil in water? The oil gets to the top. Right? Yeah. Or it rises to the top, so it'll actually be less dense. We think it probably, you know, it's kind of nasty. It's going to be more dense, but it's actually less dense. So those kind of things will be given to you on the problem. Usually we deal with several problems that have water in them, so that's usually not given in the problem. Anything else from this? Okay, let's look at a, I just kind of went through the list of problems and wanted to get several different uh, types of problems. And then we'll move on to um, force due to liquid pressure, which is another application problem. But let's try a couple other ones here. These should go pretty quick, I hope. So I'm on page 479. Number five. A force of 10 pounds is required to hold a spring stretched 4 inches beyond its natural length. Spring problem. What do we need for a spring problem to be able to solve a spring problem? That's, I think, probably a pretty fair test question would be a spring problem. Spring constant. Okay, we need the spring constant. So the force required to stretch or compress a spring is directly proportional to the distance that it stretched the spring. So there's our sentence, a force of 10 pounds is required to hold a spring stretched four inches beyond its natural length. So we've got pounds, let's convert everything to feet as well, so we'll have foot pounds of work when we're done. So four inches would be a third, right? So the first sentence, 10 pounds, stretches it four inches beyond its natural length. So that's a third of a foot. So K is equal to 30. So our setup to the problem for the work problem, if it is a spring problem, force, force is K times X. We're going to analyze this or break it down into little incremental movements so our movements are going to be delta x or if the spring is oriented differently delta y how much work is done in stretching it from its natural length to six inches beyond its natural length what are we going to call natural length zero to six inches beyond its natural length one half Will that work for that problem? Does it look like it's set up properly? So the task then is to integrate and evaluate, and our answer will be in what? Foot pounds, right? So again, the question, how much work is done in stretching it? So foot pounds is our unit here. All right, thought that one would go kind of quickly. This one, I think, will go quickly, but not maybe as quickly as that one. Problem 11. A cable that weighs two pounds per foot is used to lift 800 pounds of coal up a mine shaft 500 feet deep. Find the work done. A cable that weighs two pounds per foot is used to lift 800 pounds of coal up a mine shaft. When you start to lift this, not only are you lifting the 800 pounds of coal, aren't you also lifting the cable that is 500 feet long, right? So the initial amount of work is not only at the 800 pounds, that's the coal, but we've got it 500 feet, right, at least if we're We've got this 500 foot uh, mine shaft, 500 feet of cable, and it's two pounds per foot. So we've got a thousand pounds of cable, right? So the cable actually weighs more than the <coughs> than the coal does initially. So when we're first starting to lift this, we've got a 
to move, what is this, 1,000 pounds? 1,000 pounds of cable and 800 pounds of coal, initially, for the first little increment, we're going to have to put out, what, 1,800 pounds of force to move that? So what happens as we wind this cable onto some kind of a winch and there's less cable out there? Okay, the amount of weight decreases, therefore the amount of work required to move that, or the amount of force required to move that weight decreases. So when we first start, we're going to start with, and there are other ways to approach this problem, but I like to look at it as when I start, what do I need? And then is it a decreasing force that's necessary? Decreasing by how much per linear foot? So for every foot that I bring this thing up, there's one foot less of cable that we actually have to lift, right? And for every foot, it decreases by <coughs> two pounds. So two pounds for every x, x being the amount of linear feet that we have actually wound this onto the cable. So right at the end, you have very little cable out there, and most of the force that's required is just to lift the coal, right? So it's a variable and decreasing force that's necessary. 1,800 to start things, for every foot, it decreases by two pounds. And then we're going to crank this up, or I've got it in terms of x. I guess it'd probably be better in terms of y, right, for this visual picture. A little delta y's at a time. But I've got an x in here, so we'll call them delta x's. From the bottom of the mine shaft, we'll call that position zero. Now, does that make sense with our model that we have here? When x is zero, we're at the bottom of the mine shaft, how much force is necessary? 1,800 pounds of force. And then we want to continue this particular situation to x equals 500, right? The mine shaft is 500 feet deep. So when x is 500, what are we lifting? So right at the top of the mine shaft, all we're lifting is the coal, which is 800 pounds. So if you put 500 in here for the force part, you get 800, which is kind of all that's left, because the cable's all wound onto some winch. OK, let's actually finish the problem, because I know what the answer is supposed to be, and I want to make sure we get that answer. Questions about this? So here's our force variable decreasing force necessary in this problem in our little dx or delta x is the increments that we lifted. Probably would be better if this were y and this were dy for our visual image. Integrate it, 1800x, the integral of 2x is x squared. 0 to 500. And when we plug in 0, we get 0, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, 18 times 5, 90. Is that right? And then four zeros. So 900,000. 500 squared would be 25 with four zeros, so 250,000. So 900,000 minus 250,000, 650,000. I'm pretty sure that's the right answer. Um, what? Foot pounds, right? Questions on that one? Okay, let's switch horses a little bit to another kind of problem in this section. They call it hydrostatic pressure and force. So it is technically a pressure problem, force due to liquid pressure.
So if you think about um, a tank full of water and we want to know how much pressure there is on the end of the tank or on the sides of the tank or on the bottom of the tank, there are kind of three components that are going to determine what kind of pressure we have. I don't think this diagram's from your book, but it's it's a pretty good diagram in the fact that it really breaks it down into the three components that determine how much pressure there is on some plate or some edge of a tank. So the, we want to subdivide this region that is either totally submerged or partially submerged. So if you think about what's going to create pressure on this, let's call it the uh, end of some kind of a water trough or some kind of a tank, the force on one of these rectangles, and that's all we really need to describe is the force on one of the rectangles, and then we'll add them all up with integral calculus. First of all, the density of the stuff doing the pressing. Is it water? Is it, you know, oil? Is it, what's in the tank? What's doing the pressing? That certainly is a key component into determining the pressure on this plate or edge of a tank. That rectangle that we're describing, wouldn't it matter how deep that rectangle is as to the pressure that's on it? the deeper we are, the more pressure that's on it, right? If you get near the top of the, let's say, the end of this container, that has less pressure on it because it's near the top. The one, the rectangles near the bottom are going to have more pressure on them. So the depth of that horizontal strip is certainly important. And then what is, what's a description of the area of that horizontal strip. So these three components, and if you can think of something else valid or viable that would you think would enter in, go ahead and let me know what that is. But these are the three that come to my mind. What's the density of the stuff that's pressing on the end of the tank? How deep does it go? So those are little strips or rectangles parallel to the surface at the bottom of the tank as well as all the others, can we describe their depth? That certainly enters into the uh, pressure. And then how much stuff is there on each of these rectangles? So density, we'll describe that. That's easy. The depth of each horizontal strip and the area of each of the horizontal strips. If we can do that, then we accumulate all of the different pressures on each of the strips by using integral calculus. So. If we want, instead of one, we want all of them, what are we going to do? We're going to integrate that from the bottom of this plate, whatever it is, to the top of the plate. So we do want little horizontal strips parallel to the surface of the, in this case, the water. So can we describe that strip the same way we can describe this one? And if we can describe them all the same way, integral calculus is going to add them all up. All right, first example problem here. So we have the end of a water trough. It is a isosceles trapezoid. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like a good name? Isosceles trapezoid. How do you spell isosceles? That's not, that's not necessarily an easy question, is it? I don't know. I-S-O-S-C-E-L-E-S, -S -E -E right? Isosceles? Okay. So why is that important? I don't know. So we've got a water trough that is eight feet long. So this is the end of it, okay? So the water trough is actually out here. This is the end of it. Does it really matter that the water trough is 8 feet long? Would it change the problem if it were 10 feet long or 12 feet long or 32 feet long or 1,000 feet long as far as the pressure on the end of the water trough? When you go to the beach and you 
step your foot in the ocean. I mean, if it really mattered how wide that ocean was, you know, that we've got all this ocean. You went in the water like, what, four feet from shore? And then you've got all that other water all the way over to England. I mean, it ought to just blast your foot out of the water and just, you know, put you up Greenville somewhere, right? It doesn't matter that it's water all the way to England versus the, you know, the six feet between your foot and the shoreline. So it really, this doesn't matter. This piece of the problem doesn't matter. What matters is the shape of the end and how deep it is and is it full of water. So we've got this isosceles trapezoid. The description says that it's eight feet across the top. Okay, so you can kind of see the points are already established here, but we have to do that ourselves. It's four feet across the bottom. And, sorry, what did I say, eight? It's not eight, what is it? It's six, six feet across the top four feet across the bottom, and it's four feet tall. So we've got to come up with our own diagrams. Doesn't it seem logical to take the y-axis right down the middle of this isosceles trapezoid and then put the x-axis across the bottom, right? So we draw our own figure. If it's four feet across the bottom and we put our axis system in this fashion, then We've split it, so it's two units right, two units left. If it's six feet across the top, then we're going to go three units to the right and three units to the left. Um, we really don't care about the area of the side. What we care about in the mathematical model are the areas of these horizontal strips because the pressure on this horizontal strip is different than the pressure on this horizontal strip. So that's what the integral calculus is going to do, is add all of these pressures together. So the area of the whole side really never enters in. So if you know how to find the area of this strip, well, what is this strip? It's a rectangle, right? Then we're in business. You don't have to know the area of a trapezoid. And then to get the other point, the other part of this, it's four feet tall, so to get to this point, we're going to go over three and up four. To get to this point, we're going to go left three and up four. So we establish our own coordinates. Why do we need coordinates in this problem? To find the line. Again. Right. To find the line, this line, which serves as the edge of the water trough, the end of the water trough, but also we need this distance, don't we? From here to here? Why would we need that distance right there, which is called x sub i in the diagram? Don't we need the area of that rectangle? And what would we do with this x value? Multiply. Double it, right? Yeah. Because this rectangle is 2x long or wide. How tall is it? Delta y. Delta y, some increment of y, right? So if we need the area of the rectangle, we need to know what that distance is from there to there. And how do we describe that if we don't have the equation of this line, which serves as the edge of the trapezoid? So we could go ahead and take the point 3, 4 and the point 2, 0 and find the equation. We don't need it yet, but we're going to need it before we're finished with this problem. So the slope is 4 minus 0 over 3 minus 2, 4. Now it doesn't go through the origin, so we're not quite as easy as our last one with the uh, cone. So. Y, let's go ahead and take the point. To zero. So y equals 4x minus 8. So what are the three pieces 
three components of the integrand that are going to determine how much pressure we have on this end of this water trough. We need the density. Right. Good. Now, there is some memorization to this stuff. I know that there's always memorization to mathematics, but you're not memorizing some real complicated formula here. The density of the stuff doing the pressing, the depth of each horizontal strip, and the area of each horizontal strip. Those are the three components that determine the pressure on the end of this particular water trough. Density, depth, area. So the density of the stuff doing the pressing, it's water, 62.5 pounds per cubic foot. The depth of each horizontal strip, okay, here's our diagram. This entire distance is what? Four. This distance is, what do we call that, from the x-axis up to a point. That's its y value. So what is the depth? Here's the surface of the water. It's 4 minus y. Is that correct? 4 is the entire distance. y is this distance. So what we want for this strip is 4 minus y. Now, would that be true for this one as well? So we kind of have to make a, just a real quick check. Is this horizontal strip also 4 minus y deep. It is, right? So that describes all of them. So depth, 4 minus y, and then the area of each horizontal strip. Well, it's x from here to here. So that entire distance across here would be 2x. So it's 2x wide and delta y tall. that seem all right? Those are the three components that are going to determine the pressure on that end of the water trough. Notice the length of the water trough has nothing to do with this problem, the fact that it's 8 feet long or 10 or 12 or 20. What are the limits, and how do you find limits of integration for a problem like this? Zero to four. So how did you come up with zero to four? Y values. Y values. So and the Y values because we're looking at where did we generate our first horizontal strip, right? Right on the other side of the X axis, which is Y equals zero. And we continue to form these horizontal strips to the top of the tank, which is Y equals four. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the pieces. How are the pieces generated? Where did we generate our first one? Where is our last one? All right, well, let's doctor this integral up a little bit. What things can be moved? What things can stay here and or subtly make changes? 62.5, get that taken care of. Okay, that's got to go, right? X has got to go because we're going to integrate with respect to Y. So the delta Y for the integrand becomes dy. X has got to be replaced. Well, what is X, every X value in terms of Y, when, because it's on that line that serves as the edge of the trapezoid? Boy, that's pretty, isn't it? X is, I think Chandler, you said it. If we solve this for X, y plus 8 over 4, right? Not pretty, but we don't have choice in the matter. That's So x gets replaced by y plus 8 over 4. So we've taken care of x. We've taken care of the delta y. You can take a one-half out. OK, so right now, actually, um, I've already written the 4 down. But let's go ahead and take care of it now. We've got actually a 2 over a 4, right? So let me get rid of the 4. And this 2 over this 4 will come out as 1 half. Is that good? 
So we've taken care of multiplication by two and division by four. We slid it out front, and everything else needs to stay, right? Four minus y, y plus eight, we're integrating with respect to y. So what is that going to be? Negative y squared. How many y do we have? Negative four y. And the constant is plus 32. Any question, first of all, about where anything came from in the original integrand? Density, depth of that horizontal strip, and area of that horizontal strip. Or how this became this. X had to go, right? Everybody convinced of that? We're trying to integrate with respect to Y. We've got to get rid of X and what is X in terms of Y on this problem. Everybody feel confident you could integrate and evaluate from here? Yeah. Okay. So we've been doing that for quite a while. Now, these kind of problems can get kind of bizarre, okay? Now, you say, well, a right is or an isosceles trapezoid, that's already kind of bizarre, but they, you, you have to make choices um, as to where things are. I don't know that we'll make it through this problem, but let's look at on page 481, problem number 30. Um, I do want to do this problem. I don't know that I want us to do this problem right now. Let's let's table that till tomorrow, but let's let's do another problem. We'll come back to problem 30. Um, Let's set up the diagram. I'm just trying to get different situations. Uh, trapezoid, this one has a uh, hemisphere. 18, it's page 480 actually. A hemispherical tank shown is full of water. Sorry, I'm a little scattered today. Um, let's go back to this problem. <laughs> Something just came to mind when I was reading that problem. And we'll, do, we'll set up 18. How would this problem, if I were organized, I would have asked this earlier. How would this problem change if instead of the water trough being full of water, suppose it's not all the way up to the top, which is at the four-foot mark. Suppose it's at the two-foot mark. Okay, would that be true? Integration from zero to two? Density would be less. Well, the density is still water, so the water is going to be the same. So that's going to stay the same. What about the depth? Because the top of the water, the surface of the water, is now not the top of the water trough. It would be at height 2, so each one would be 2 minus y deep. So that would change. Right, but would the area of each little horizontal strip be the same? Yes. They'd still be 2x wide by delta y tall, and the edge of the water trough is still that same line. Where would we get our first horizontal strip? At y equals 0, where would we get our last one? At y equals 2. So we do have to pay attention. Is it full? And if it's not full, we'll adjust because the top of the surface of the stuff doing the pressing, it's important to know where that is. Sorry, I intended to do that. And left that out until I read the next problem. All right, 18. A hemispherical tank shown is full of water. Given that water weighs 62.5 pounds per cubic foot, find the work required to pump the water out of the top of the tank. So I don't have a picture of this, and a lot of times, even though if you do have a picture in your book, you're going to have to draw your own picture. So we have a hemisphere, which if you look at it from the side, looks like a semicircle, right? So there's our tank. We get to choose 
so here's the, the surface. It's full of water. We get to choose where to put our axis system, which is why I wanted us to look at this problem. We could, here's our, here, here are the, the choices, okay? We could come right down here with our y-axis and come right under here with our x-axis. That's a possibility. Or we could come right down here with our x-axis and right here with our, with our y-axis, right here with our x-axis. So what determines where you put your axes on your problem because that's how we're going to name things, right? Don't we eventually have to give an equation for this edge of the tank, wherever it is? I know which one I want to work with if I'm going to have to name the equation. If you're working with circles, which this is a circle, even though it's a hemisphere, the tank itself is hemispherical. When we look at it two-dimensionally, it looks like a circle. What's the easiest equation to work with in terms of circles? All right, just the old center at the origin, right? So which one of these two has center at the origin? This one, right? So we get to choose where to put our axis system. So let's come down through here with our y-axis to make the equation. Now, it could still do the problem, but I think this makes the problem easier if we put our x-axis at the top of the tank. Now, it doesn't say this in the problem, but it does have it labeled on the diagram that the radius is 5 feet. Okay. So what's the equation of the edge of this semicircle? Is the center at the origin? Yes. We, we get to choose that. So when we get to make that choice, it makes our life easier. So it's x squared plus y squared equals 25. So we'll probably need to solve it for x squared or solve it for y squared, but there's the equation. We need horizontal strips parallel to the surface. We need the density of the stuff doing the pressing, it's water. We need the depth of each horizontal strip. This is, this is actually a little trickier than it. Isn't this y now? From the x-axis down to this point? Is that correct? Isn't that how deep this strip actually is? Almost. Right, it's negative. The negative of that is how deep it is. This is a negative value. Does everybody agree with that? So in order to make that positive, we're going to have to negate it. So the depth is actually negative y. Uh, well, the way I've got my axes, this is the origin. So I don't, I mean, you can mess with that if you want to, but the way I've got my picture, that is y, which is negative, so that in terms of depth would be negative of y. I don't think you're going to go wrong by calling that y. You might get a negative answer. You'll just have to negate it. And what's the area of that strip? We need to know that distance, which is x. Is that correct? Isn't that the x value of that point? We need to double it, so it's 2x by delta y. So that means we're going to integrate with respect to y. Well, obviously we are. That's how we're forming the horizontal strips. And what would be the limits? Where are we down here? Negative 5 all the way up to y equals 0. Now, if you had not used negative y, but used y instead and gone from 0 to 5, those two would have
compensated for one another and you'd still have a positive answer. Okay, we're out of time. We'll finish this up tomorrow and probably move on to uh, moments in center of mass.